Hello boys and girls, this is Aunt Fernita, and I have a wonderful story for you called God's Ten Rules. Today's memory verse is from Exodus chapter 19, verse 8. It says, We will do everything the Lord has said. The message for today's story is we thank God for showing us how to live. Do you have some rules in your house? Rules like not eating between meals or putting your toys away? Rules help us, and they help the Israelites too. The Israelites were still in the desert. It had been three months since they left Egypt. They were camped beside a mountain when God told Moses he had something very important he wanted to tell his people. God promised Moses that if the Israelites would follow his directions, they would live happier and healthier lives. He would bless them, and the people in other nations would see how much God loved them, and they would want to know about God too. The people promised, We will do everything the Lord has said. Moses was to tell the people that God wanted to talk with them. He was to have them get ready to meet with God. So the people washed their clothes, and they made sure that they were clean too, even behind their ears. Then the people fasted, which means they didn't eat any food, but they drank water instead, and they prayed. Three days later, God came to the top of the mountain in a cloud of thunder and lightning. The people heard loud trumpet blast, and they saw the mountain shake, and they were afraid. But God didn't want the Israelites to be afraid. He loved them. He spoke directly to them and told them about the ten special rules he wanted them to live by. We call those rules the Ten Commandments. Do you know them? Let's review them. Number one, love God the most and don't love things or people more than God. Number two, worship only God. You don't need idols or things to look at to worship Him. Number three, Speak God's name with reverence and respect. Number four, keep the Sabbath day holy. The Sabbath day is a special day spent with God each week. Number five, treat your mom and dad with respect and obedience. Number six, the life of others is important. Don't hate or hurt others. Care for those who are needy or hurting. Number seven, be faithful to the person you marry. Number eight, don't take things that aren't yours. Number nine, always tell the truth. And number 10, be happy with what you have. Don't want other people's things. Those are the 10 commandments. Then God told Moses to come up to the top of the mountain. There, God wrote those 10 important rules for happy living on stone tablets. God didn't use a pencil or a pen. He wrote on the stone tablets with his own finger. God gave us rules to live by because he loves us. He promises that if we obey him, we will always be happy. When we obey God and live as he asks us to, we are worshiping him, and he will help us to obey him. Let's remember to thank God for showing us how to live. This podcast was brought to you by gracelink.net and Studio El Piso. For more children's resources, please visit gracelink.net.
Hear the trees joyful cry, praising you, and so will I. A new song I'll sing, Lord, I will glorify and bless your voice. In the midst of uncertainty, our faith can struggle. Our walk becomes labored, our heart heavy. There's something about the unknown which seems to weaken us. It drains our patience and blurs our focus. Yet in the middle of everything stands a faithful God a God who's not swayed by the struggle, who isn't moved by the winds of chaos, a God who remains faithful even when our faith is fragile. It seems more difficult than ever to not worry about tomorrow, yet that's exactly what God has asked us to do. For when we cast our burdens on Him, the troubles of the moment begin to fade. When we trust the plans He has for us, our fear begins to subside. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, our focus becomes consumed by clarity. 
Yes, we are in the midst of uncertainty, but we can be certain of one thing. God is faithful, and that is more than enough for tomorrow. Welcome everyone. As we journey through God's Word today, my encouragement for you is to simply position yourself to receive a word from God. As I mentioned time and time again, God's Word never returns to Him void, but will always go out and accomplish that which it was meant to accomplish. And I believe today that uh, this word, the pursuit of happiness, is meant for someone to equate true joy and fulfillment by their proximity to God, by how close they can get to their Savior. You see, in 2006, a movie was released starring Will Smith called The Pursuit of Happiness. Now, this movie basically followed the struggle of a, at the time, young entrepreneur, Chris Garner, as he tried to uh, get into the stock market uh, by enrolling in an internship. And uh, he had to overcome tremendous challenges. In fact, he was homeless and at the same time had to raise his son. But no one was the wiser because he basically did what he had to do to achieve his goal. Now, this is a very inspirational film. But I'm here to let you know, speaking about the pursuit of happiness, which is something that the world is uh, engrossed in trying to achieve. <laughs> just by the barrage of uh, different uh, councils, whether it be through books or television programs um, that people are pushing forward. Uh, this method, though it is inspiring to overcome challenges on your own with your own determination and grit, even though it's inspiring to overcome, overcoming with God is infinitely more satisfying. Last week, uh, we examined the topic Humility 101, and uh, that message could be simply distilled down to an equation. <laughs> uh, humility plus obedience equals unity. Humility plus obedience equals unity. And we are examining, we examined rather last week, uh, the book of Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 2 to be uh, precise. Uh, now, Today, we'll actually be staying in the book of Philippians, but skipping forward two chapters. And we'll be looking at uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through to 8. And there is a declaration made by Paul to the Philippian church from the get-go. He says in this section, in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Now, that's a very powerful statement. Uh, you see, he's saying rejoice always, which means that your joy should be continuous. The rejoicing needs to happen in perpetuity. <laughs> uh, it means that your joy is not confined to your circumstances. Your happiness is not reactive. Your joy, and I will use rejoicing and joy interchangeably throughout this message, but your joy is not subject to the folk around you. Your joy, your consistent, sustained joy is inexorably attached to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen wherever you are or say amen in the chat? Our happiness is not reactive. You know, oftentimes people will have conversations with us and they'll ask us how things are going in our lives. Uh, they'll ask how the kids are doing or how the marriage is. And we'd give them a surface level answer and say things are fine. But 
for those of us who have, you know, true friends, real friends who are not believers, they'd lean in really close and ask, but are you happy? Are you happy? <laughs> now, this is very interesting because even non-believers understand the difference between reactionary joy and sustained joy. The happiness that they are speaking of is not a happiness that's just restricted to the moment. But over the course of time, that uh, how, how, how encouraged are you? Throughout a bigger, wider sample size, how fulfilled are you? In fact, the, the secular minds, and this was discussed by Dr. Nadine Plummer's uh, sermon uh, two weeks ago, uh, looking at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, at the top of his chart is self-actualization. And so what the people are really asking is, um, <clears throat> are you self-actualized? But the thing is, uh, their self-actualization is actually placed in uh, the things of this world, <laughs> um, the pleasures of this life. Um, and is it happening often enough to give you some kind of sustained joy? But I'm here to let you know, saints of God, that, that our self-actualized state of being as believers is in proximity to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King. Now, what does this look like? I'm not saying that we should be socially awkward. I'm not saying that um, we, whenever someone dies or someone is ill or there's some kind of major negative event in our lives, that we should be smiling ear to ear. We're not, we're not saying that. Yes, we will react emotionally, but what we're talking about here is sustained happiness. The pursuit of sustained happiness. There is a divine optimism that informs our state of being, which the world can't fully grasp or even understand. You see, so even our emotional well-being is dependent on our proximity to God, our emotional health is wrapped up in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, the Spirit of Prophecy says, whenever a man accomplishes anything, whether in the spiritual or in temporal lines, he should bear in mind that he does it through cooperation with his Maker. There is great necessity for us to realize our dependence on God. Paul then proceeds in this pericope, this, this passage to say, uh, essentially to give us the roadmap of how to accomplish this sustained joy. He says in the following verse, in verse 5, let your moderation be made known before all men, the Lord is at hand. Now, now, listen to what's being said here and, and, and read it for yourself. Let your moderation be made known. That sounds like an oxymoron. How can we broadcast our moderation? How can we uh, loudly uh, proclaim our humility? And that doesn't seem to make that much sense. But we have to understand the context. We're not broadcasting our humility, but our moderation is highlighted because it is different than the status quo. Our encounter with Christ is countercultural, and this countercultural approach exposes us. You can't hide when you're different. The Bible talks about you are the light of the world. Uh, this light cannot be hidden, but it will illuminate by the mere fact that we are moving in the opposite direction, that we are different, reveals our moderation, reveals our humility, reveals our allegiance to God. You see, as our relationship with 
Jesus grows. Our uniqueness attracts others, and that attraction to Christ through us fuels our joy. The Bible then says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. You see, our lack of anxiety comes from simply running to God for everything. Are you hearing me, saints? We are at peace or have less stress when we have that bigger brother to run to, that father to bring our challenges to. I remember times when I was younger and because I had a big brother, it was easy for me to, uh, if I got in trouble or met up in a jam, to quickly run to him for help because he was there and he was evident. The second I tried to take on those challenges by myself, I would fail and fall flat on my face. But if I had a big brother to run to, whenever I found myself in a predicament, it was reassuring and allowed me to move through my adolescent years with more confidence. We have a God that will listen to even the smallest and most insignificant issues that we struggle with. What God wants us to do is practice taking everything to God. We are constantly throughout the day having conversations with him saying, God, in our minds, saying, God, does this work? Does that work? Should I go over here? What should I do today? Like we're constantly in conversation with God. That's where the whole practice of praying without ceasing comes from. Constantly being engaged with God. And when we have that, uh, uh, that system in place, when we have that practice of daily and moment by moment bringing things before him our stress will dissipate because we're taking everything to him we're in constant conversation with our lord now this is a prayer that that, that paul is encouraging the philippian church to pray everything in supplication and thanksgiving let your requests be made known to god this is a prayer exercise now, in a previous sermon, I spoke about where our emphasis should be placed in our prayers. It must be on honoring God and praising God first, before we even get to the stuff that we're asking for. The Bible says we should be anxious for nothing. Whatever it is that we desire, whatever it is that should normally stress us out, should not. But in everything, as we present it to God with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. In a previous sermon, I stressed the need to emphasize our worship and thanksgiving to God. Because what that does, if we do this in our prayers and spend the bulk of the time on our knees, giving God the praise and the worship that is due to him and him alone, what it does is it puts our problems in proximity to God's power. And it creates in us a peace and a calm because we know how big God is. And as we praise him, we recall moments that he's allowed us by his magnificent power to overcome challenges. We recall those instances where we didn't know how things would play out or work out, but then he just shows up right on time. And that allows us the peace, knowing that God will take care of us. We have to pray often and always to receive the joy of the Lord. Take it to God in prayer. Let it be something that is continuous. Pray without ceasing so that you'll be able to develop a robust relationship. You know, I have never come across, hear me now saints, I have never ever come across a pessimistic prayer warrior. <laughs> I have never come across a pessimistic 
prayer warrior because of the hours that they have logged on their knees wrestling to God. It has made them divine optimists. Can somebody praise the Lord today? The Bible then goes on by saying the peace of God, which passes understanding, will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so Paul here is revealing an indicator that we are on the right pass, path. rather. And this is the peace of God that transcends human understanding because it is divinely imparted. In other words, God imparts his peace to us. So God, uh, through his power and his mercy, will allow us to receive divine resilience, divine optimism, and divine peace. There's a song that says, I've found a new life. I've found a new life. And then it switches by saying, if anyone asks me, what's the matter with you? Tell him, this is the response, that you are saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized, I've found a new life. When, when people look at the way you approach life and see the difference, to see you desperately trying to extract the good out of the bad, not being downtrodden by evils, but finding hope in the midst of evil. They can't understand it. They won't be able to wrap their minds around it, but they'll be inspired by it. The peace of God that passes understanding will allow your anxiety to dissipate, will allow calm to take hold of your life, and will allow you the room to rejoice continually. The Bible finally talks about in uh, verse 8 of Philippians chapter 4, the things we must expose ourselves to. Uh, this peace, uh, this sustained joy does not simply happen in a vacuum. There are things that we must intentionally do to put ourselves in a position not to be uh, <clears throat> Uh, distracted or displaced by the enemy. The Bible talks about how we must expose ourselves to honesty, to justice, to purity, to love, to goodness, to things that are virtuous and praiseworthy. That means what we ingest with our eyes and we hear with our ears the programs that we watch, the conversations that we have, if we desperately, with all intentionality, encourage <clears throat> that we are only around things that reflect these characteristics, they will put our minds in a place that God can pour his peace into. That means the gossip has to go. It means the backbiting <laughs> in the name of Jesus needs to stop. It means the judgment that we have one toward the other uh, needs to be eliminated. It means that we have to desperately put ourselves in conversations and watch programs and ingest content that is virtuous and praiseworthy. Not saying that you can't, you're supposed to shut yourself off from the world. What I'm simply saying is that you should be an influence to the world and the world not be an influence to you. And so my encouragement to you today, saints of God, in order to have lasting and sustained joy, in order to fulfill the declaration that Paul is making in this context to the Philippian church, Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice, we have to put our minds in a position 
not to be overloaded with garbage. <laughs> we need by, uh, to develop the classical conditioning to run to God whenever there's a problem. Like a child runs to a parent, like a younger sibling runs to a bigger sibling, we are constantly running to God and having conversations with Him throughout the day. When we put ourselves in a position to not be contaminated by the things of this world with the help of the Holy Ghost, and at the same time intentionally go to the source that will purify us and cleanse us and empower us, we will be happy in Jesus' name. There is no tutus about it. We are eliminating the bad and accepting the good. And as a result, we have lasting, sustained joy. If it is your desire today to pursue happiness in Jesus, I'm just going to ask that you say to yourself, Lord, I am willing. <laughs> I am willing. And if you're watching online, you can put in the chat at this moment in time, Lord, I am willing. But it does mean intentionally, with the help of the Holy Ghost, putting yourself in a position not to receive the bad and accepting that which is good by bolstering your relationship with God through constant prayer and through constant conversation. I know that as we follow this course, because essentially what this is, is the process of sanctification, uh, the laying aside of the man of sin and the accepting of the man of Christ, going through this daily process, dying to self and accepting Jesus and allowing him to fill you up so that you can be used as his vessel. As we go through this process, friends, family, saints of God, let's recognize that we will get to a place where our circumstances will not be able to affect the joy that we have in Jesus. And so let's claim this by faith even now, in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Loving Father, once again, we want to celebrate you. We are thankful that you have given us the opportunity to uh, gather from the words that you inspired Paul to share to the Philippian family, that we can achieve sustained happiness in this very sad and chaotic world. We are glad, Lord, that you have not left us alone to figure it out on our own. But Lord, you are with us all of the way and you encourage us to be in constant conversation with you while at the same time recognizing the destructive power of evil influences. Lord, have your way with each of us today and allow us, Lord, as we seek to serve you day after day that ultimately um, our relationship and the work that we do inspired by you will translate into you coming again and freeing us from this sin-filled earth as you come to take us home so that we can live and reign with you forever. Bless us, Lord, and have your way once again is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching and for being a part of our worship experience here at Kendallwood. Now, if you've been blessed and you want to be a blessing, please go to our website, kendallwood.com, and under the Giving tab, you'll see ways to support our ministry. 
Also on our main page, you'll be introduced to a number of different ministries and activities that are happening here uh, with the Kendallwood family. And if you want to be a part of this, or if simply you have a prayer request or something you want to share or ask, please uh, call us or email us at communications at May God richly bless you as you seek to serve him today.